I want to take a moment today to give a, a bit of context and clarity around the message that you're about to receive. Over the past days, there have been any number of stories in blogs and social media about me. And I believe that the body of Christ and those who are leaders are to be held to a higher standard according to scripture. And a part of today's message speaks to those places that have been swirling. I wanna make it clear that though my conversational and emotional breaches are wrong. This was not physical or sexual. I've only ever been with one woman that is my wife. But the areas where I have missed the mark do not absolve me of responsibility. But I wanted to give you context and clarity so that you can receive this message the way God intends for it to be received. It is my prayer that God would allow your heart to be open your spiritual ears to be attentive to what he's saying to the church. Let my life be an example to you of how God wants integrity and holiness to be the calling cards of his leaders. To my wife, I love you. I honor you today for loving me, for walking with me, not only in therapy, but for the insight that you've given me to begin to do the work as we have been doing for some time now but to continue in that process. Thank you, Aventure. I love and honor you, and I thank God for you and our children. And to the Relentless Church, may the very best days of our church be in front of us, because they are certainly not behind us. God bless you. Now let's go to church. Second Corinthians chapter seven, verses nine and 10. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. And it's so important. I pray that you hear my words. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And Isaiah 57 and 15, for thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. I just want to take a moment to say to you, Relentless Church, to the body of Christ, to those who have looked to me as an example of leadership and pastoral oversight, I want to take this moment to tell you I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the areas of my life that I left unattended that I was apathetic about in the areas where I have treated the calling of God, the grace of God, and the hand of God casually in my life. For every area of behavior that has dishonored the holiness of God, I want to tell you I'm sorry. There have been a number of things in blogs, some of them accurate, some of it not, but all of it my responsibility. I apologize for putting the name of God in harm's way. And I and I alone take the responsibility for the actions that harmed and injured God.
God's sheep. No matter how many pseudo excuses one can hurl in a moment like this for the purposes of self-preservation, all of them ring hollow when all that is truly needed is the truth. My prayer for you in this moment is that you will use the discernment of the Holy Spirit to see if this is remorse or repentance. I have learned that remorse simply means I'm sad because you found out. Repentance is I'm sorrowful and I will change. For as long as I can remember about my life, I always felt that something was wrong. Particularly when I said yes to God at 13 years old, and for the past 34 years, reconciling the humanity of the man versus the divinity of God. And I've asked God over and over, why did you choose me? Why do you use me? I didn't ask for this. You raised me up. And I told you, I'm not the one. I told you, I got all of this stuff. I've been praying for years. And my answers never come. But I pray for others and you answer them right away. Why did you raise me up if you knew that I was going to miss it? And, and in the process of trying to serve you, my humanity would explode from behind the facade of religious perfection. Why am I in this moment? And God says, this is the process whereby which you will learn two things about me. There is nothing about you that has occurred to me. I knew who you were before I chose you. And number two, I love you too much to let you live a lie. For those who need to hear me say this, the name of the Lord is holy. The standard is holiness. The word of God is utterly holy. He is not to be toyed with. Church is not a game. And pastors are held to the highest of standards. Moral integrity. Character when no one is looking. Fidelity and faithfulness in marriage. And for me, not submitting to process not staying accountable, and not utilizing the voices available to teach me the tools have caused me to make bad decisions. And I want to make it very clear again that no one carries that but me. As I've said to my wife, I say to her now in this moment, Aventer, I am sorry for the pain that I have caused you and my prayer is that the life I live from this moment will be one worthy of the love that you have extended and that our family receives from. I am grateful for you, for our children, and I pray that God would restore the joy that we had in the days when we would drive around the city dreaming. You know more than everyone else the areas of pain that I've carried for years, the horrific self-fulfilling prophecies that you told me. Stop confessing those things. But I believe that this moment had to come so that God could make me the man I need to be. But I'm sorry for the pain that I've caused. You don't deserve it. You're an amazing woman of God. And I love you. And I will face me so that the man that comes out of this moment will be able to honor you in a way that I never have before. To my church, I am sorry. You've gone through enough from cars to meetings with leaders that have caused great pain and deep division amongst political ideologies to one thing after another, I want to tell you I'm sorry. The standard has not changed. 
Holiness is still right. And I want you to know that it is my prayer that from this moment of true repentance that you will see emerge from this moment a pastor that you can be proud of. Now, I don't want to talk as a pastor anymore right now. I want to talk as a man. My name is John. I'm from Cincinnati. My mama raised me. I grew up in church. I love Jesus. I also have a lot of stuff that was buried deep down inside. And as I've been sharing over the past few months, how critically, profoundly impacting therapy has been for me, it is in this season of my life where I've been making radical changes, leaving old patterns and old habits. And this is what I've learned. You can repent and turn, but devils will not. And if they don't get their way, they will attack. But I want to make it very clear. No matter where I've been and the things that I've done, I am not that person. Because none of us are our worst thing or our best thing. I am moving forward. And I am going to live a life in line with the calling that the gracious God has still afforded me. And I'm going to serve him until I die. What I've learned about myself is that I do believe in God and I fight for everyone else, but I never thought that I was worthy of fighting for. I've treated myself contemptuously. I've seen myself as unvaluable and unworthy of love. I've lived a life rooted in mistrust and distant interaction. And all the devil needs is just a little bit of distance to try to kill you. He walks about like a roaring lion, the Bible says, seeking whom he may devour. And I found myself running from accountability, running from the safety of wise counsel, making decisions in my anger, my rage, my pain, and my emotion. And because of that, I have put everything that God has ever entrusted to me in harm's way. A consistent pattern of self-sabotage rooted in a lack of identity and a shame that I can't shake. But God in his mercy has given me this chance to be an example to my son and my daughter and to the body of Christ that no matter how gifted you are or how well known or how famous you are or how many people follow you on social media, if you say that you serve God, but you don't line up with his standard, he will deal with you. What I've learned about God is he will always address you privately before he addresses you publicly. But out of his love, he will defend the integrity of his name, and he should, because no one should cause sheep to stumble because they won't deal with their sin issues or their flesh issues. And I am no more special than anyone else. And if I can be honest, there have been moments when I've said, God, why do you keep messing with me with all the things that I've been privy to over the years in the lives of so many other people that preach. And God says, it doesn't matter what other people are doing. I'm dealing with you. And I've learned this. It's God's job and prerogative to expose. And I've learned in my own life, my posture when I see brokenness is to walk in backwards. And God alone will have to deal with his church. But right now, he's dealing with me. And I'm submitting to this moment, not out of shame, but out of thanksgiving. I know this may sound crazy, but I'm so grateful that God has whooped me publicly. Because the Bible says we endure chastening as sons. When your father loves you, he corrects you. He whoops you so that you don't keep living a life of Hophni and Phinehas, who lived aberrant lifestyles and God had to take them out of here. 
I'm not going to die because I won't deal. And this is my moment to heal. I want to share with you something that's very important for you to know about me. I have never preached a sermon in my conscious mind that was self-serving. I have always tried to lift Jesus up. I've never preached a judgmental sermon because I know the myriad areas of brokenness in my own life. But there are some lessons that I want to share with you, things that need to be distilled from this moment so that you understand what God dealing with me represents to the body of Christ. Number one, the Bible says judgment begins at the house of God. First, that God is defending the integrity of his name against anyone that would use, manipulate, or utilize witchcraft principles to keep people subjected to the personality of man versus the person of Jesus Christ. For too long, churches have been built based on personalities. And one of the reasons that I didn't address my issues sooner is because I incorrectly assumed that if I left this seat, that the church would fall apart. What pride to assume that a holy God needed an unholy, unsubmitted vessel to do his work. If God can use a donkey, he can use a man, even if they're unsubmitted to get his will done. But I want to participate with God, and I want to be whole while I do it. And I've never been whole. I've always presented this picture. But the truth is, I've always been fascinated by healthy marriages and by strong men who knew who they were. I've always been fascinated by the people who walk it and live it and talk it. Because for so many years, I saw the presentation of church and not the truth of the gospel. And somehow I said I despised it, but secretly there was a part of me that envied the fact that people could live how they want and still preach, could do what they want and still have a gift not realizing that the Bible makes clear that you can preach really well and sing people into a frenzy and end up in hell because hell is real and God is holy. I found myself secretly envying what Proverbs says is to not be envious of sinners. Proverbs 23 and 17, do not let your heart envy sinners but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. There was something in me that wished I could get away with what other people were doing, but I found out I'm a terrible sinner, so I'm going to stop trying, and I'm going to serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my strength, because the love, the mercy, the grace, and the blood that has been extended to me is worth the rest of my life. I make no excuses for any area of sin or behavior that dishonored God's holiness. It's nobody's fault but my own. And my prayer for you is that you will take responsibility for any area in your life that doesn't line up with the word. Because let me tell you something. If you serve him in any capacity, if you're a pastor that's watching me, hear me clearly. If God will address me, he will come knock on your door. So if there's anything in your life, you, sir, or you, ma'am, that does not line up with the word, I urge you, give it to God now while you still have time. He is not playing with his holiness. For those who would look at me and say, yeah, man, you said all this stuff before. You're, not, you, you're no different than anybody else. You're a fake. You're a phony. Let me tell you something. I've never preached anything other than a gospel of repentance. That Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father. That sin, unsubmitted, unrepented, will get you sent to hell. But no one 
has to go to hell if they call on the name of Jesus and receive the free gift of salvation. Yeah, well, you still got stuff. Guess what? We all do. The only difference is mine is public. Yours is hidden. The truth is I don't get the luxury of anonymity. Use my life as an example. I'm not fake. I'm human. Fake is saying shame on you for the same thing I struggle with. Now, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. If you have been saved, you don't have to live in shame. Don't do what I did for so many years, harboring a secret life of shame and a lack of identity and using it as an excuse to not deal with your issues. No, I'm not fake. I'm the most real thing the church has ever seen. I'm a man who needs the same Jesus I preach about. And any one of you who has ever had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me knows this. And God could take my life this second if I'm lying. I have never rejoiced over sin. I don't play games. There's a difference between wanton and willful disobedience and bondage. And I have, according to John chapter 8, been enslaved to areas of sin in my mind and in my actions. But Jesus did not die for me to stay enslaved to anything for any reason. And there will be people who will try to hold you hostage and try to figure out ways to mute your voice. I will never shut up talking about the greatness of Jesus, the greatness of my God the mercy and forgiveness that has been afforded to us all because of his great love with which he has loved us. I want to take a moment to thank some of my friends. And you know who you are. I won't name you, but I thank you for confronting me in love because faithful are the wounds of a friend. Because there are some people who say, oh man, it's cool. I understand. God understands. No. I needed the friends who said, John, I'm distancing myself because I don't like how you handle your money and I don't like how you live your personal life. It's unsafe and it's unbecoming of a man of God. And those are wounds that cause you to wake up and realize that you can't live your life your way serving God. God deserves for us to participate with him by living a life that is pleasing to him. Well, if I'm really going to add value to this moment beyond a moment of verbal repentance, there has to be some action steps. Before I tell you where I'm at in my process, I wanna offer you an opportunity to take a quick look at your own life to see if there's anything that the enemy could use to keep you hostage to a version of yourself that Jesus already died for. Now, I feel the Holy Spirit. I was reading Judges chapter 16. There was a guy, his name was Samson. We know the story of Samson. He was a Nazarite from his birth. Many times when you see pictures of Samson, you see this man that's swole with all of these muscles and, you know, built like a bodybuilder and, and he has long hair. But that's not an accurate picture of Samson. An accurate picture of Samson would be to find the skinniest person you know and find them with seven dreadlocks, seven locks of hair. He was dreaded out. That's a whole nother sermon about culture in the Bible. But this idea that Samson found himself with a woman that was designed to kill him, and he chose it. Let me tell you what sin does. It blinds you to the reality that there are people who genuinely want to see your demise. Ask 
the Holy Spirit to show you who the Delilahs are in your life. Because here's the thing about Delilah. Delilah was sent from hell, but she smelled and looked like heaven. Be very careful of the things that the enemy sends. He never sends something that you don't have an appetite for. He will always send you what speaks to the unresolved areas in you. The Bible says she blatantly asked him, tell me the secret of your strength. How can I bind you? And he toyed with it for a minute and he, he gave her excuses. He gave her stuff that wasn't true and he would wake up. And the thing that he had just said to her was happening to him. Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he would break the rope off or he would break the bowstrings. But he kept playing with that devil. He stayed there even after God allowed him to escape over and over again. And the Bible says, she said, you don't love me. You don't tell me the secret of your strength. Devils will make you think they love you all the while trying to figure out what makes you tick so they can take you out of here. Hear me by the spirit of the living God. If there's anybody who keeps seeking to identify the weakest areas of you, they are not from God. They are sent from hell. The Bible declares that she kept bothering him. She pestered him, the Bible says, to the point of death. And he finally told her the secret of his strength. And when he had told her the secret of his strength, the Bible says she began to torment him. And she lulled him to sleep on her knees. I want you to understand, everybody thinks that this was sexual. Samson fell because he was talking to the wrong woman. Let me help you to understand. You better know who you're talking to in this season. This is a season to identify the voices of God versus the voices of the enemy and to make your circle as small as necessary so that it can produce fruit for your life. This is not the season for you to be casual with your words or casual with your friendships or casual with your relationships. And don't allow the brokenness of your past or an unresolved appetite in your flesh or an unconfessed sin cause you to bring someone close to you that is committed to killing you. Ask me how I know. The Bible says she lulled him to sleep on her knees. He wasn't looking for sex. He was looking for understanding. And the lie of the enemy is that he understands your pathology better than God. And since God won't give you an out, I will. The enemy will always offer the look of relief without showing you the full cost of the choice. Stay with God. Live holy. Serve him with your whole heart. Don't assume that because God hasn't dealt with you that he won't deal with you. Oh yes, he will. His name is on the line. And your legacy is on the line. The Bible says when Samson tried to get up he said to himself, I will get up as before. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Scariest scripture I've ever read. The Lord left him. Why did God leave Samson? Not because Samson was weak. God knew he was weak. He left Samson because Samson told the truth of his heart to someone he knew was trying to kill him when he had access to the God who made him. Stop telling devils your heart. Tell God your heart. Stop telling people who don't have the ability to change your situation the truth of your situation. Keep your mouth closed to people who can't help and open your mouth to the God who's able to heal. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. 
to present you before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. Get to God. Don't allow any voice. Don't allow any man. Don't allow any woman. Don't allow any appetite to cause you to go to the wrong person because your need is a legitimate need. But if you attempt to fulfill a legitimate need in an illegitimate manner, the enemy can have victory in that area in that moment. And yes, God forgives. But there are consequences for our actions. There are people who may never listen to me preach again. And I am so very sad about that. But then I also believe that this moment will call more people to repentance unto salvation. In that, my pain will have been worth it. I want to thank my cousin Muggsy, who is an amazing man phenomenal husband and father who in the darkest moments of the past days told me, lift your head up, fight for the things that matter, your wife, your children, control what you can control, stay in the presence of God. This is not the end. This is actually the beginning. And the truth is he's right. Because as of today, I'm not only going to champion therapy and mental health professionals, I'm going deeper into the process so that I once and for all can receive the same freedom that I pray for everybody else. So let me tell you what that looks like. As of this very moment, I have been in therapy for quite some time for myself as an individual and for my marriage collectively. But now I have submitted to a process of restoration that will require me to continue to do the deep work, not only of therapy, but of uh, emotional health professionals physical restoration because my body and my soul have been deeply wounded and impacted by a life that was rooted in shame. Spiritual, emotional, mental, and therapeutic. And I don't know how long that process is going to be, but I have what I believe is probably the seminal theological voice of our time that is overseeing this area of my life along with other pastors and leaders who I submit to who will give me lines of demarcation to mark my journey to a place called whole. And you may say, well, Pastor, what's the difference between this moment in your life and other moments that we have walked with you through? I never submitted to anybody in those other areas, whether through shame, fear, or uh, an inflated sense of worth. Well, the church needs me to keep preaching so that everybody can be able to take care of their families. If God needed someone who was stuck in sin to help him, then I ain't read the Bible. God's church is his business. And it is my prayer that a mature, relentless church will continue to sow into this great work while I continue to seek the help, the health, the healing, and wholeness that I deserve. My kids deserve a whole father, not a fragmented puzzle piece of a man who keeps trying to pick up his his unattended areas and put band-aids on it. I don't want band-aids. I'll take the scars, 
but I don't want the Band-Aids. Dr. A.R. Bernard said that there's a difference between scars and wounds. A scar marks where you were and what happened and shows that healing has occurred. But wounds are still very much open and they require an attendance. They must be attended to. I have scars and I have wounds and I've had them for many, many years. So I'm not asking you to forgive me. I've asked God for that. And David said, against you and you alone have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. So I've asked the Lord to forgive me. But I am saying I'm sorry. But I'm also asking for you to pray for me. The same prayer you would want if you were fighting for your life, if you were fighting for freedom, if you were fighting for wholeness. How long is the process? I don't know. I've never been this way before. But my gift will not dictate my healing. My position will not dictate my healing. People with more discernment and who don't need me, nor are they impressed by me, them guided by the Holy Spirit will dictate my process. Some weeks you'll see me, others you won't. But my prayer is that you will maintain your diligence and commitment, not only to this church, but the work of the local church and the global church collectively. All I want for me is the same freedom I want for you. I don't want you to be the only one walking out the promises of God. John 21, we see Peter deeply wounded because he had denied Jesus three times in John chapter 18, in effect, cutting off his relationship with Jesus forever. There was no way for that relationship to be restored. But in John chapter 21, we find the resurrected Jesus on the beach with breakfast prepared. And he says to Peter and the disciples, children, have you caught anything? He said, no. He said, throw your net on the other side. We caught so many fish and Peter said, it's the Lord. He dives off the boat and he gets to the shore. Jesus says, come bring some of the fish that you have. I've already got some prepared, but I want what you have in your hands as well. What is the lesson? Whatever you have in your hands is enough for the journey, enough for this moment in process. But God already has a meal prepared for you. Bring yours. Save yours for later. Because he's already prepared your right now. Jesus has a conversation with Peter, a brokenhearted man who regrets his bad decisions, who feels that his life is over. And Jesus says, Peter, you love me? Yes, you know that. Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? He says, yes, Lord. He said, tend my sheep. Peter, do you love me? You know that I love you. You know all things. This is not about love. This is about my humanity. I blew it. I failed. I failed in your face. I sinned. I did wrong. I'm sorry. And, and, and you were watching me while I did it. I'm so sorry. He said, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. That means walk with the babies, the baby believers, then give them processes and procedures so that they can walk it out and then feed them into maturity. Walk with them, give them process after you have been restored, strengthen your brothers. And 50 days later, Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost. 
in effect launching the New Testament church from his lowest moment to 50 days later being used by the Holy Spirit to usher in the church age. Am I saying that this process is 50 days? I don't know. I believe that it's going to be much more involved than that. And my promise to you is that I'm going to stay in that process until I'm whole. Because more than living a lie for people, I want to walk in truth for my family. God deserves truth in the inward parts. And so today I'm asking you to join with me to go on a journey of self-discovery and reflection and deep, intense therapeutic healing so that if there's anything in your life that doesn't look like Jesus, you address it now. Because racial injustice is still a thing. We're in the middle of a deeply contentious election cycle and our cities are still burning. People being shot seven times in the back while others can kill two people with an illegal gun and walk right past the cops, even with his hands up, trying to confess. People have better things to do than stay on blogs rejoicing in what they think is the demise of who they have incorrectly ascribed as a charlatan. No, I didn't make me. God made me. And he's going to get the glory out of my life. One caveat before I close this message. In Judges 16, we find out that Delilah was paid to find out the secret of Samson's strength. There are people who have made brokenness a commodity, seeking the worst about people to monetize their pain in vulnerable moments. May the Lord heal whatever broken place is in you that needs to see someone fall for you to feel better about yourself. I'm a man. I'm not a God. I serve God and I'm God's man. And my failures will not be the final chapter of my life. To my wife, to my children, to my mother, to my grandmother who's in the great cloud of witnesses, to my aunt who prophesied into me, to my spiritual father who admonished me, and to the leaders in my life who believe that God's best days are for me are in front of me. Thank you. And now I leave this moment not as some superhero trying to show off, but as a man still trying to reconcile the areas of my life that had never been addressed. Live holy. Serve God. Do right. Stop gossiping. Stop hating. Stop hoping for other people to fail so that you can feel better. May the body of Christ grow up and may we reflect the restorative power of Jesus on the beach instead of trying to kill our wounded. Everybody has something they're not proud of. And it's only by God's grace that the thing you're not proud of has not been made known to the world. So let my life be an example that God can deal with you very quickly. But if you turn, you will be very much like Peter and not like Judas. I heard Dr. A.R. Bernard give an illustration about Judas and Peter that they were both at the dinner, but Judas left early. He went out quickly Jesus continued speaking. And the difference between Peter and Judas is Judas left early. Don't leave early. Don't leave this work early. If you've walked with us through all of the things that we've had to walk through, don't leave early. 
God is with this church. He's with this work. He's with this staff. Ask the Holy Spirit. Continue to be generous. If this church is your home, then fight for me like I would fight for you right now. Maintain your commitment in tithe and offering so that we can serve this present age. You know what's crazy about Judas? Judas hung himself. And had he not taken matters into his own hands and repented, Jesus would have restored even him. That's the power of the blood. Don't leave early. God's not finished. Not with me, not with my family, not with this church. And he's not finished with you. If you have found yourself in a broken moment, stuck and afraid that you're going to be found out, go ahead and tell on yourself and let God handle it now and heal you in your heart so you can go ahead and be free. And don't be afraid of what people will say. Even if your past was yesterday, as of right now, it's over and it's under the blood. The blood of Jesus is available to you right now. And in a way that I've never said it before, I say it today, the doors of the church are open. And if you need Jesus, he is available to you. His blood is able to heal you and cleanse you and restore you. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, now is your moment. Say these words with me, Jesus, it's me and I'm sorry. I've sinned against your holiness. I've done wrong in your sight. Forgive me. May the blood of Jesus cover me. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. Thank you for the